everyone, and welcome to this week's Eco Tour Adventures Wildlife Weekly Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and it's a, such a pleasure to be spending the Wednesday with you all. Now, our guides have been out all week getting the latest and greatest in wildlife sightings to show you on video this week here, right for a couch vacation. The way this is going to work is I'm going to show you some fantastic video that's happened this week. We're going to give you a chance to win our trivia question, and at the end, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got a good question that's nature related, wildlife biology related, try and stump me. Go ahead and start commenting in the comment section with those questions and we'll get to it at the end of the broadcast. In the meantime, let's get started. Our first and biggest news this week is wolves. And I know you guys are excited to see some of that. So let's go ahead and check in with Laura and see what she had to see this week. Hi, this is Laura just back from a trip to the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone National Park. Um, me and my guests were amazed to find that just the night before when we arrived, uh, a pack of wolves called the Junction Butte Pack had tried to take down a little itty bitty baby bison. <laughs> so the females in the herd were protecting that baby bison. They were encircling him to ensure that the wolves wouldn't have another chance to, to take another bite. <laughs> of course, wolves are strictly carnivores. They eat meat from animals like elk, bison, sometimes rodents, and occasionally deer and other mammals. Well, those females were doing such a good good job protecting that little baby that they escorted him back into the bigger herd of bison. There had to be 200 bison in the large herd and once they got inside that herd it was going to be very difficult for the wolves to make a move on that little injured calf. My guest on tour uh, lovingly called the other bison the, the bouncers of the herd. Um, they were helping to you know, try to remove those wolves you know, from the bigger herd. You know, trying to like use their horns, use their brute force and you know, huge size. Sometimes a big bison could be up to 2,000 pounds and they were you know, trying to persuade those wolves off and away from the calf and the rest of the herd. American bison evolved as a great plain species. You know, imagine being way out in the wide open on the prairie and having all your friends with you but nowhere to run and hide. You know, it's not like with deer where you can just scoot into the forest and disappear from a predator. Instead for bison, it's more like you have to group up, you know, get real close to one another and use your intimidating size to, to kick out that predator. So with wild bison, usually if a predator is around, they'll put the, the weak, the young, the old, the sick in the center of the herd and then just defend them. So of course, bison are equipped with huge horns. Your know, horns could be used kind of like, like a sword uh, against a predator. You know, an adult bison weighs in up to about 2,000 pounds. So, you know, of course he's, he's huge, he's scary, and if it comes down to it, you know, he will trample a predator if he needs to. I don't know what became of this entire situation. I, I hope for the best for that little baby bison and its mother. But, you know, unfortunately, we, we had to, to go back to Jackson and you know, this, this situation could be playing out for multiple days. If anyone knows of you know, what became of this scenario, please let us know. <laughs> I'm really curious to find out. And yeah, best of luck, little guy. 
So that's some pretty amazing footage there from Laura. We really appreciate her taking her camera with her up to the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone. Seeing wolves up there, the Lamar Valley has the greatest density of wolves in the world, uh, is really a special experience. And it's something that we've actually got a multi-day trip coming up for, which we can talk about in a little bit. In the meantime, where is everybody watching from? You know that's one of my favorite questions to ask every week. I'm always amazed at all the amazing places that this video has spread to. So please do let me know in the comment section where you're watching from. Also, this, uh, this video tends to get shared a lot amongst people who plan to visit the area. So go ahead and give some advice in the comment section. Where did you go when you visited Jackson Hole? Are you planning on visiting Jackson? What are the kind of things that you wanna do? And lastly, of course, we take requests. So if there's something you'd like to see in our video series, I'm more than happy to send out our naturalist and biologist to go and try and find it for you. Uh, and you might be able to see it the next Wednesday. So without further ado, I've got some great stuff for, on bears for you all this week. There's a lot going on when it comes to bear activity, but let's first talk about grizzly bears. So everybody's favorite grizzly bear, 399. There was a lot of concern on the internet and locally when folks hadn't seen her um, for about a week and a half, I think it was, uh, which I have to be honest with you, after having spent Oh, I've been tracking 399 since 2007. That's not uncommon this time of year for her to just kind of disappear back into the woods for a week, even two weeks, even three. And so when people were concerned, I wasn't particularly concerned, but sure enough, she's doing fine. Turns out that she went ahead and crossed over the river uh, and she and all four quadruplets are doing well. They're spending a little bit less time in front of the public, staying away from some of these summer crowds. And that's probably all to the good for those cubs. What's happened is that the elk calves have finally gotten old enough. The 399 is having a hard time catching them and she's having to go on to other food sources. As we move more into the summer, she's gonna become a little bit more distant until we get into September and the fall, and then we'll begin to see her much more regularly again. Seth, our newest Eco Tours naturalist, got a great view of her daughter this week, Grizzly Bear 610. Now, Grizzly Bear 610 is 12 years old, and she has two sub, not sub adult, two three year old cubs. Um, they're about to be on their own, two and a half year old cubs. Uh, and they're gonna be, um, this is their last summer with their mom, and then they're gonna be on their own after that. Uh, and he actually got a great view of her in Northern Grand Teton, as well as a really unbelievable scene with black bears. Now I'll warn you, both of these videos are a little bit shaky. We don't quite have Seth set up with all the proper equipment, but they were too good to miss out on. So hope you'll bear with us because it's really worth it. Let's check in with him. So we're here at Oxbow Bend. And we have what appears to be 610 and her two cubs. So we're here at Lupin Meadows. You'll notice uh, an elk just walked behind that tree there. This is a lone cow elk. It's strange to see a lone cow elk. Usually they're grouped up in a cow-calf harem herd. When they're by themselves, they go off by themselves to, have, to drop their young, to have their calves. And they'll have them in willow bushes and tall bushes where they'll hide them for up to 24, hour, 24 to 40, 48 hours, excuse me. When they're first born, they're scentless. So mom will leave them in the bushes while they kind of figure out how their legs work and she'll come back in 24 to 48 hours. It appears that a black bear, the one on the left, that's the sow, that's the mother. On the right, we have a cub with her, a brown faced cub. I can't see it, but there you go. You just saw the young cub pull on it. It looks like they might have gotten lucky and stumbled upon that lone calf's, or sorry, that lone cow's calf. I would say they definitely got her calf because she's been here for about 10 minutes watching them and they haven't moved at all. 
So some shaky footage, but some really extraordinary footage. I personally have never had the opportunity to see black bears stumble upon or even purposely find an elk calf um, lying in the, the brush like that. So pretty extraordinary that mom and calf certainly had, if mom and cub certainly had a big meal. Uh, very unfortunate, of course, for that elk and her calf but that's the cycle of life, everything's gotta eat, so sometimes it can be a little hard to see. In the meantime, we've got some really great news uh, from Yellowstone. Mike actually got this very patriotic view of a bison while Old Faithful was erupting on the 4th of July. I don't think you can get more American than this particular shot that he got. Uh, Old Faithful, of course, is uh, our most famous geyser in Yellowstone National Park, certainly not the tallest, or the longest duration, but certainly sort of the classic, sort of a can't miss, and to have a bison posing in front of it really is just uh, such an, uh, I don't know, such an American thing. I felt very patriotic when I saw that. So a big thanks to Mike for that great view uh, from Yellowstone National Park from the 4th of July. Uh, it's pretty fun to see that. There's been quite a few bison in the Old Faithful area. Um, that actual same bison made national news in front of Old Faithful for the 4th of July, uh, which sort of surprised us because we thought Mike was the only one uh, who had necessarily caught that video. So that's pretty fun. Uh, and thanks very much for that. We've got lots more coming in from Yellowstone next week for you. Lots of hot springs, geysers, thermal features, a whole lot of geology action. So you don't want to miss that as well as a whole segment on small mammals next week. Uh, river otters, muskrat, beaver, uh, skunks, all sorts of fun things. So you definitely want to check that out as well. We've got uh, more bear footage for you because everyone who watches this knows what do I want to show you? I want to show you bears, of course. Kelsey got a really interesting view of more black bears in breeding season. So let's check in on that. Kelsey found these two bears while in Yellowstone National Park. And this brown cinnamon colored black bear was being pursued by this lovely, shiny black fellow. Probably a male looking for a potential mate in that cinnamon brown colored black bear. This kind of shows you how different colored black bears can be. The black black bear followed this cinnamon likely female for quite a, quite a long time. Kelsey was able to watch the two of them. Uh, the black male never got too close, but you can see this cinnamon female looking back at her and uh, both moved back off into the woods, hopefully for a little potential rendezvous uh, a little bit later. Seth also got a great view of a black bear cub up in a tree this week. And this little fellow was pretty cute, but had a little bit of difficulty figuring out how to get back down after climbing all the way up that tree. So lots of views of black bears this week. And for those of you guys who missed the headline when I was talking earlier, 399 and the cubs are fine. 610's fine. Nobody saw Blondie this week, but that's not atypical. I'm quite sure she's fine too. Lots and lots of black bear activity going on. We even have a black bear with triplets in Northern Grand Teton National Park this year, which is super a treat to see. Um, and then I also, just at the last minute last night, got some footage of a mother moose with twins, which we'll certainly show you next week as well. So lots of multiples uh, in Grand Teton National Park this year, something I haven't actually seen um, that commonly in quite a few years. I think a combination of a really, really rich fall, um, a very rich spring yet last year, a really good snow melt, lots of green grass. Everything's kind of thriving out there right now, which is so fantastic to see. One of the best wildflower seasons I've seen in many a year. Now on to our everybody's, well, my, mine, and many other people's favorite segment uh, here on Wildlife Wednesday. And sadly, it's gonna be our last of this series. Mark went to go check on the nesting birds of the red-tailed hawk nest and the hummingbird nest. And he's got great news to share with you, but it does mean that our nest watching is coming to an end. So let's check in and see what he found. Hi guys, Mark Bile here with EcoTour Adventures with a final nest update from the red-tailed hawk and hummingbirds we've been watching all spring. Uh, I knew the time was getting near the end of before these birds were getting ready to fledge, so I've been trying to check the nest daily 
and on July 2nd, all three red-tailed hawklets were still in the nest being fed by the adults. And on the 3rd of July this year, they were gone. So very successful nesting season for the red-tailed hawk pair, mated pair, um, to get all three of those young nestlings to fledge. Uh, they have been kind of learning how to use their wings around the area and making a ton of noise. There have been a lot of calls to each other and the parents have been kind of uh, showing them the ropes as we've uh, been getting some gusty wind conditions and they have been kind of learning how to use those wings. Really, really super fun to watch. So successful nest for all three red-tailed hawklets. They are now out and about as well as the hummingbirds. So three days later on July 6th, all uh, both hummingbird nestlings fledged um, and on the fifth when I, the last time I was actually able to get some footage of the adult female feeding those young uh, broad-tailed hummingbirds uh, they were starting to kind of vibrate above the nest and starting to uh, kind of test their wings a little bit and then the next day on the sixth I went back to check on them again and they were they were out and about so Successful nests all the way around. We still have some house wrens in the area that are feeding young nestlings. And then uh, some other species like American robins and the house wrens again will be uh, going for a second brood uh, this summer season. So things are busy and picking up, but good news is, is that all the nestlings that we have been watching all spring have successfully fledged from the nests and they are out experiencing the world for the first time. Super fun to watch. Thanks for checking in and uh, we'll see you next week. So a fond farewell, a bon voyage to our red tail hawk chicks and our hummingbird babies. It's been so much fun for how many months now have we been watching these nose nests. So a huge thank you to Mark who has not had to go out there just once every week and go film both of these nests, which are not close together, uh, but to go out multiple times every week so that we could all enjoy and see that once in a life opportunity with a hummingbird nest. I would love to tell you that next year, next nesting season, that we'll have another one for Wildlife Wednesday. Um, but my goodness, I've never had a chance to observe a hummingbird nest like that. So we'll put Mark on the case for sure. Hopefully he's willing. Lots of thanks to him. But in the meantime, this video series um, does take a lot of time and energy to, to produce. And it's only worthwhile for us if you're willing to share it and spread it. So if it's something that you enjoy watching and you like seeing me on Wednesdays every week, we sure would appreciate if you would support us and all of our guides by liking and sharing the video. I know every video asks you that, doesn't it? But it really means a lot to us. And anything that we can do to spread this means we can make it bigger and better and continue it every week. So thanks very much for all of you all for tuning in. We have one more really fun bird video for you this week. More nesting birds for you to see, as well as my favorite dinosaur in Grand Teton National Park. Let's check in. Laura got such a fun view of these little raven chicks, almost fledged, basically fledged, in their nest. You can see the one here still has that amazing, curious, almost human level of cognitive ability playing with that stick. So good luck to those cute little raven guys there. They're pretty fantastic. In the meantime, Kelsey also checked in on baby birds with this young sandhill crane chick, also known as a colt, with its two parents. There are 27 species of crane in the world, and all but two are endangered. Uh, one of the non-endangered ones are sandhill cranes. We have several million in the United States, but boy, is this chick cute. Now, for those of you guys hoping for uh, T-Rex, I'm sorry to let you down because it was a sandhill crane, but come on, you've got to agree with me that that is as close to a dinosaur as we have in the modern world. Sandhill cranes look like what would have happened uh, if velociraptors had just evolved, which of course they did, right? When we talk about dinosaurs, one of the predominant theories is that um, while many of the dinosaurs were um, killed by a massive extinction event, those that survived evolved into what we now think of as birds today. And those sandhill cranes are about as close as you can get to a velociraptor. They even sound like a velociraptor out there. Um, so always really fun to see them as well as that little cult chick 
who is growing big and strong and I've been able to actually really be able to have a nice close view of that chick this year. They've been kind of localizing in a single area and it's really been a pleasure. So those are the videos that we have for you this week. We've got a couple quick things to show you, a great trivia question. I really think I may have stumped you this week. Um, and then I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got um, a question for me, start asking it. I saw that we've got a couple good ones here already, including one from Don. I promise Don I'll get to that in just a moment. But in the meantime, I wanted to tell you um, about our fall photography workshop that's coming up um, with Nate Luby. Let's check in and see how great that's going to be. So if you're interested, make sure to join us on what will be the trip of a lifetime. Get those photos you've always dreamed of getting with such a talented professional photographer. If you're interested in our fall photography workshop, we've got some information on our website. I'm sure Taylor in the comment section will post some more information about that as well. We're not here to advertise at you, so I don't want to spend too much time at that. But I do want to let you guys know that that's going on because it's such an amazing trip. Um, and something to certainly consider. Oftentimes this trip is sold out, so for us to have a little bit of availability, this is probably the year to go uh, for sure. And boy, those fall aspens and crisp cool colors. If you've never been to see us in the fall, it's really a good time. So, you ready? It's trivia time. So don't forget, I'm gonna be answering your questions in a little bit, so make sure you write those in the comments. But in the meantime, let's get triviaing. Is that a word? Probably not. So let's start by answering our trivia question from last week. So the way this works is I'm going to show you last week's. You guys are more than welcome to comment in the comment section while that video is going on. If you think you know the answer, I will go ahead and give you what I think is the answer. Uh, and then uh, we will give you this week's trivia question. So the way this is going to work for this week's trivia question is you're going to comment in the comment section what you think the answer is. We will choose someone at random to win a $10 gift card to our EcoTour store. A little bit of information about that. We created this online store as a way to pay for employee health insurance during the COVID closure. We're still using 100% of the proceeds of our online store to pay for our employee health insurance. So if you ever wanted to wear steel clothing or have a Thomas D. Mangelson print, you know, most famous wildlife photographer in the world, right? Um, or just um, some great pottery, gunpowder art, some things that the guides have made themselves. There's this amazing bear hat that I so want that's on there right now that our guide Elise has made. Check that out on our online store. Uh, and hopefully somebody's gonna get $10 towards the store, which is at least enough for some owl stickers. Um, which by the way, I bought some owl stickers because I couldn't stand it and they're amazing. But First and foremost, let's talk about last week's trivia question. So here it is. The, the question was, and you can comment in the comment section if you want, what animal is this? This is brought to us by Sean. So 
have, little dude. All right, anybody have any guesses? So you may remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about all the different kinds of weasels we have in the valley, and we were having a big weasel debate, and people in the comments were actually having a debate with me over what constitutes a weasel versus what doesn't. Uh, and I meant to look that up to make sure we knew the answer. But the short version is we have more weasels here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem than anywhere else in the world. So there's your random trivia of the day. And this indeed is a weasel, but we weren't going to accept just weasel as the answer. I wanted to know what kind of weasel. In this particular case, we can narrow it down to two options, a long-tailed weasel, which is pretty unusual, or a short-tailed weasel, sometimes called an ermine. Um, and it's a little hard to see in this video, but I'm tempted to say that this is a long-tailed weasel. If any of the biologists uh, are in the comment section, feel free to argue and disagree with me because I could be wrong about that. That could be a short tail, but I think it's a long tail weasel. Um, so we will choose somebody at random last week who got that correct. And uh, once I confirm that I'm correct about what kind of weasel it is, and we will give you a $10 gift card. I think that one was like way too hard. Uh, so everybody told me the one the week before, the fox, was too easy. And I think that's too hard. So what I've tried to do for this week's trivia question is to give you something right in the middle, not easy, not hard, maybe something in the middle there. So all you have to do to answer this week's trivia question and get a chance to win that gift card is just tell me what kind of animal this is. Same idea, right? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a hint. It's another weasel, but it's an easier weasel. This trivia question comes to us from EcoTours biologist Verlin this week, who caught this video in Grand Teton National Park. Let's check it out. Hey, buddy. Hey there. Okay, did everybody make a guess? Are those little guys cute or what? I mean, my heart melted a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, loves the water, is a kind of weasel, but is a really cute one. Actually, I don't think there's any weasels that aren't cute, except for maybe wolverines, of which that is not. Wolverines are cool in their own way, but I'm not sure I'd put them cute, precisely. So go ahead and comment in the comment section what kind of animal that is. Uh, and hopefully a whole bunch of you will get a chance for that $10 gift card. And let me know also, am I asking questions that are too hard or too easy? Because I need some feedback because I seem to go too far on one end of the spectrum or the other. Um, but yeah, all right, so that's the video content that we have for you guys this week. Now is the really fun time where you guys can ask me any kind of questions that you want. Uh, and I'll see if I can't get you some answers. What I'm gonna do is I've got our comments listed right here on the iPad, so bear with me when I look down so I can answer some of the questions and we'll go from there. So let's see, we'll start with the one I think I saw Don ask pretty early on. Don says, concerning bears with 399's cubs be killed by her, by her older male cub or only males that intend to breed 399. I realize he wouldn't breed his own mom. Hang on, I gotta think about this. Would 399's cubs be killed by her older male cub? Okay, so really good question. Really, really good question. Uh, really complicated question. So I'm going to try to make it kind of simple. Uh, first and foremost, so 399's had 24 cubs now. I'm assuming you're talking about the four quadruplets that she's currently got, those little cubs. And would they be killed by their own sibling, I guess, is what you're asking, right? Uh, by her older male cub. Yes, okay. Well, the good news is... We don't have any older siblings that are male uh, in Northern Grand Teton right now, we don't think. Her last set of cubs, the sub-adults, we're not sure if they're male or female. I suspect female, but I could be wrong. I saw um, one of the sub-adults earlier this spring being pursued by another grizzly, which is strongly suggestive 
that she was in heat and he was pursuing her for that purpose and that would make that cub a female. But uh, unfortunately, male grizzlies in their sub-adult stage, all grizzlies in their sub-adult stage, which is between three and five years of age, that tends to be when they get in the most conflict with uh, people. So all of her male cubs have gotten themselves into trouble. Uh, one of them had some problems with cattle, another one, uh, and was relocated. Um, another one was getting into bird feeders, <laughs> was relocated for robbing bird feeders. You don't think of grizzly bears going after bird feeders, but in fact, uh, all that black oil sunflower seed, they're omnivores, right? That's pretty delicious, it's pure fat. Um, we've had a couple other things that have happened over the years. Uh, another cub, which was female, uh, was shot from behind by a, a moose hunter who just uh, was frightened that there was a bear in the woods, even though she was quite a long distance away. Um, and he was convicted of a uh, hunting without a license. Grizzlies can't be hunted, right? Um, sort of a very light poaching offense for that. Um, but yeah, no current male older brothers, so to speak, to go after these guys. That said, male grizzlies will kill grizzly cubs. And it's a little counterintuitive. And sometimes the father will end up killing its own cubs, certainly not intentionally. But basically, male bears have a strategy um, that can be a little hard to understand and seem a little hard-hearted. But once you understand sort of the, um, the ecology behind it, it'll make a little sense. So let me go over to Africa and bear with me. I'm answering your question, Don, I promise. So is, have you ever heard about how like when a male lion takes over a pride, it immediately kills all the cubs? Um, if you haven't heard that, that's, that's very commonly true. And it's a little hard to understand why that would be. But if you think about it, if the male lion, um, he's only gonna have a couple years where he's sort of top dog, right? He's only got a couple years where he can breed the females of that, her, um, that pride and rear his own offspring. And the way evolution works if you're gonna shorten it and make it really simple, is the animal who has the most offspring, who have the most offspring, who survive, kind of wins, right? So a male lion is gonna immediately kill all the cubs in the pride because as long as the females are nursing, they're not gonna come into heat. So if he kills the cubs, the females will stop nursing, they'll come into heat sooner, he'll breed them sooner, they'll bear his offspring sooner, and he'll be guarding his own cubs instead of guarding another male lion's cubs which of course is the whole point. He wants to be having his cubs out there. So grizzly bears do the same thing for the same reason, but they don't live in groups like lions do. They don't live in prides. So what that means is that male bears will kill cubs when they can find them. Um, research seems strongly suggestive that um, a father killing his own cubs is, is surprisingly rare. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it's certainly possible. In the same way, while there's no research about uh, a sibling, an older sibling, uh, I would say it's certainly possible but highly unlikely. And that's for the very simple reason of a very big male uh, roams the territory that 399 hangs out in, and she traditionally breeds with that same male every year. Uh, and a younger male wouldn't stand a chance probably against this old timer. So generally speaking, uh, she's got sort of the same mate every year that's a big, big guy, and nobody else is on top enough to consider her an option. So Don, hopefully I answered that question. Kind of a complicated one. I really enjoyed that one. So thank you. Let me see what else we've got here. Don says, could 399's cubs be killed by 610's male cub because he's male or is there threat only from, only from males wanting to breed 399? So... That's a little more complicated. There's no good reason for 610's male cub to kill those cubs unless he considers the area his territory. Um, so while, once again, possible, it's going to be a young enough animal uh, that, first of all, it's unlikely just because 399 is very protective and probably would be able to chase a young male bear off pretty effectively. She's a big bear. Uh, but also because of, like we said earlier, uh, relatively uncommon. But certainly possible. Uh, which, let me think about it, 610's cub would be a cousin to 399? Okay, if 610 is 399's daughter, then 610's cub would be her grandson killing off its, well, no, not siblings. I'm going to have to think that one through. Bear family trees are really hard. <laughs> um, 
But go ahead and comment in the comment section if you can think that one out. Uh, Libby asks, has anybody seen the blue grouse this year? We got to see one last year. I have seen two blue grouse this year. They both moved too quickly for me to get a video of it. Um, our big grouse expert is Verlin. If you'd like to see bluegrass on film, I will certainly ask Verlin to see if he can't film one up for you, maybe as soon as next week. So thank you for that. We have seen them in the valley. We're seeing more and more of them every year, uh, but uh, they move pretty quickly. They're, uh, by the time I get my camera out, they're always out of view, but yes. So thank you for that, Libby. Let's see. Do bison ever have two calves or is it pretty rare due to their birth sizes? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, so yes, twins are possible. They're absolutely possible in bison. Uh, we do see it on occasion. Very, very, very rare. There's never been a study done on the rate of twinning, so I can't give you a nice scientific number. I've seen just a couple in my lifetime. It's actually kind of hard to tell if a mother has twins because bison raise their calves communally. So what happens is one female will kind of keep an eye on a whole nursery group of calves, four, five, six of them at a time, while the other females will graze nearby and then they'll kind of relieve each other. Um, and so the, unless the bison is actively nursing, it's actually kind of hard to tell which one is the bison's mother. Uh, they're mostly kind of running around with each other. So uh, twins are rare and we don't see them very often. It's very hard on the mother to raise two successfully. They tend to be a little smaller as a result. Uh, but when it does happen, it's also kind of hard to tell because of these nursery groups they live in. So really good question. Um, definitely possible. Reminder, of course, pronghorn always give birth to twins. So different hoofed mammals, different plan, right? Gian asks, will this, will the, this year's bear cubs nurse during the upcoming winter? So um, grizzly bears raise their cubs for two uh, to three years. Um, basically when they're first born, when they come out in May, they're called koi, cubs of the year. Then they go back into hibernation with mom. And yes, there is nursing in the hibernatory den at that point. And then when they come out, they spend another summer and fall, go back into hibernation with mom again. Um, at that point, um, they're beginning to be weaned. It kind of depends on the bear. It depends on the mother. It depends on her milk supply. And then that spring, they're definitely weaned. Um, and uh, usually the courting male bear, the male that wants to breed that grizzly, will drive those cubs off. So that whole second summer is fundamental for those cubs learning all of the incredible diversity of food sources that grizzlies rely on and have to have to survive. 45 different food sources between uh, May and November every year that these bears are relying on and they move from food source to food source to food source to food source, which is why bears like 399 will be really visible on the roadsides when they're eating things like glacier lily and Indian potato plant. And they'll be really uh, visible in willow areas when they're going after elk calves. But after the elk get big enough and fast enough, those calves cannot run a bear in um, less than a month after being born. Then at that point, they have to diversify to other food sources. One of my favorite food sources for a bear, which would take a lot, you'd have to teach a cub to do this, is they go up into the high altitude to eat army cutworm moths. Yeah, you heard me. Grizzly bears eat moths, typically in August, which is why um, we don't see as many grizzlies in August. We see black bears in August, but grizzlies are a little tougher because they're all in high altitude chowing down on moths. But they have some of the highest caloric content of any wild food, so it actually makes a lot of sense for these bears to do it. But you'd have to learn from your mother not only where to go in the high country, these big scree fields and boulder fields, to get that food, but also how to pull the boulders and lick up big handfuls of moths all at once with your paw and your hand. Um, it's a skill. Uh, a really good example of this is in Yellowstone National Park. Um, bears for many years fed on garbage and, and, and food from humans. Uh, it was considered to be quite the thing to put all of your garbage in the garbage pit. And uh, between about um, 1880 all the way up until the 1950s, early 1950s, you would go to these dumps and watch the bears eat garbage. And because these bears became so dependent on human food sources, they lost the ability to forage for certain things, particularly cutthroat trout. So if you ever see brown bears up in Alaska, like the Katmai, 
um, going after salmon and swiping them out of the water and eating them. They have to learn that skill from their mother. And we now know, because our grizzlies don't effectively go after spawning cutthroat trout, that if you don't learn it from your mother, it's unlikely you're going to reacquire the skill. And so bears actually don't have that as a food source. Um, most bears anyway, uh, in Yellowstone National Park. Although the hope is eventually they'll relearn the skill and they'll be able to teach their cubs. Uh, and that'll certainly help with the number of grizzly bears and grizzly bear recovery when they have that additional food source. So really good question. Thank you very much for that. Ooh, we've got lots of right answers for the trivia question. So I think I finally maybe hit the right point between too easy and too hard. Toy asks, do wildflowers bloom in Grand Teton and Yellowstone throughout the summer months? Yes. So we have what's called a green wave. So the flowers start on the valley floor and then summer actually advances up the mountainside. So when it's summer on the valley floor, it's not actually summer um, at altitude. And so the, the, you might see something like a, um, a lupine on the valley floor right now um, or a lowland larkspur which peak right around now, but you'll see it maybe a month from now at 9,000 feet. Uh, so this green wave as it moves up the hillside, that's what the bull elk are actually following is that fresh green grass. So that's why they're kind of high up um, on the hillsides this time of year, typically. Uh, although we've got some footage that Seth sent me this morning that shows you certainly can find them on the valley floor that we'll show you guys next week as well. Kim asks, what's your favorite hike in the park? Well, Kim, if you were out with me, I'd ask you, you know, what your goals are. Uh, we have so many hundreds of miles of trails. And I assume when you say the park, you could be Grand Teton or Yellowstone, but we'll start with Grand Teton. Um, so many miles. So I'd say, well, do you want to see a lake or a waterfall? Do you want to keep it flat under three miles, under five miles, under nine miles? Uh, you know, when it comes to what's your favorite hike in the park, it actually really depends a lot on the person who's doing the hiking. But I would say for almost anybody out there of any age, one of my favorite things is to go to the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Preserve, which is part of Grand Teton National Park. It's part of the southern part of the park and go hike out to Phelps Lake. It's about a mile and a half out to the lake um, and a mile and a half back from the lake. Beautiful wildflowers along the way. You're hiking right along Lake Creek. It's almost entirely flat. There's just a little brief little elevation part where you have to get over a moraine to get to the lake. The lake is stunning and beautiful. There's composting toilets. It's very easy uh, in terms of the, the trail. Um, you can absolutely easily take a four or five year old on it without any difficulty. Um, so that's a really nice choice for just about anybody. Uh, and the, the Lawrence S. Rock of a Preserve pre um, has a system where it keeps uh, only a small number of people inside the preserve at a time, so you're not having to deal with a busy summer crowd like you might have to um, on some of other, our other hikes. Some other great options would be something like Taggart Lake, which is another three-mile loop to a true alpine lake. You can see straight to the bottom of it. It's stunning and beautiful. If you want to add an extra two miles to your hike, you can do Bradley and Taggart Lake, which is really fun. For those of you guys that are extreme, I suppose, really, really want to crush it, get up into the mountains. There's nothing better than getting up into these alpine canyons. Um, Cascade Canyon is particularly stunning, as is Open and Death Canyon. I know it's called Death Canyon, and you guys are going, oh my gosh, why would I go in Death Canyon? The Civilian Conservation Corps built the trail in Death Canyon. Two of the guys building the trail got in a fight, a knife fight, uh, and one of them sadly did not survive this knife fight. So they call it Death Canyon. So it sounds really horrible, um, but it's actually probably my favorite spot for wildflowers in the summer. So that's a really fantastic choice as well. And if you really, really want to go crazy, hiking all the way up to Amphitheater Lake, which is just uphill switchbacks. I think it's seven miles. I think it's seven miles. Uh, it is a true, true alpine experience. Really, really neat, but not for the faint of heart. It's definitely an uphill journey. So um, try out the Rockefeller Preserve, see if that's fun. Then maybe Bradley Taggart might be a nice one. There are so many fantastic hikes in the park. Uh, so for sure, if you've got more questions about that, ask us this. We're always happy to answer in the comment section and uh, we can see if we can't get you set up with the perfect thing. All right, let's see if we've got any more. That might be it for this week. 
those are all of our questions for this week. If you're watching this later on, you didn't get a chance to watch it live, first of all, come watch it live. It's more fun. I can answer your questions that way. But second of all, feel free to ask a question in the comment section. I will continue to keep an eye on this, as will our naturalist Elise all week long, and will continue to answer your questions here. So please feel free. We're here to help you out. If you have certain things you'd like to see, certain animals, do let us know. We've got sort of an ungulate hoofed mammal extravaganza for you uh, coming up next week. I think I got so many videos this morning that I couldn't quite pack in today. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope you guys have a fantastic week. Don't forget to like and share our video. Please, please, please. We sure would appreciate it. Make a big difference and uh, have a wild week. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody.